summons came in the hour before the dawn, when the world was still and gray. Up, up, Stark, the king roared. Up, up, we have matters of state to discuss. Up, up, everybody, we have matters of a song of us and fire to discuss. Ooh, we're continuing our rereading series. And we got to the chapter when Ned and King Robert talk about the past and about assassinating newlywed Daenerys Targaryen. I know I say this in every rereading video, but I really mean it. I loved this chapter so much. It actually might be my favorite chapter so far. And there's so much to talk about. I collaborated on this video with one of our patrons, Avi who has a lot of insights about the story and about life in general. So shout out to Avi. So the chapter is packed, packed with juicy stuff. So this video might run a little longer than usual, but it will definitely be worth it. So before we kick things off, if you've been enjoying the rereading videos, maybe you can share them on the Facebook group that you're active in that's about a song of ice and fire or a forum or tell your friends or something okay 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 so I thought the recurring theme in this chapter is the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we tell others the way we narrate our lives but for me what first drew my attention and immediately popped out is how Ned and Robert are like two <laughs> aging action heroes in a guy movie. They're trying to see if they still got it. Robert wants to talk about matters of state, so Ned invites him inside. But speaking in a tent is boring. Ugh. Robert is like a child who is not allowed to play anymore, so when he has a chance, he wants to speak in the field, right? He wants to feel young again. He wants to feel like a man again. So they're out and about. They're laughing, they're talking about women, they're complaining about their wives and their boring lives. And they're lamenting their lost youth and freedoms now that they are married men. Hmm. Let's dive a little bit into Robert's and Ned's relationship. I loved the conversation that these two old friends are having. There's so much drama in this one little chapter. There's a ton of history in it, both personal and political, and we get to understand their relationship much better. So Robert is waking Ned up, calling him to action, but Ned, he's a party pooper. He is a reluctant hero, refusing the call. He didn't want to go to King's Landing in the first place. And now he just wants to stay in the tent. <laughs> That's like the proverbial 3M phone call on the secure line. <laughs> Vice President, we have matters of state to discuss. Wake up. Mm. But Robert already has his entourage ready there, so obviously there's nothing to do but go out into the unknown after his king. And that's also a recurring theme. Ned setting off after the king into both of their deaths. After the ride a little while, Robert asks, have we ridden into a graveyard? Not yet, Robert. So they're going off the king's road, the official road, and they go into nature, riding hard with the tension rising between them. And they couldn't be more different. They couldn't be more different. We're gonna see it all throughout the chapter. Ned is bound by duty. Robert is, uh, you know, somewhat bound. Uh, what about sleeping around? No. Ned is honorable. Robert, me. Nyum, 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 nyum. Jorah Mormont, they talk about Jorah Mormont. Eddard thinks he should be a corpse. Robert thinks he should be a spy. What about Daenerys? Ned looks at her as a human. Robert sees her as a dragon spawn. Jamie Lannister, Stannis, uh, it never ends. They can't agree on anything. <laughs> or maybe they complete each other. You know, Ned is like a younger brother that does not wish to succeed his older brother. He doesn't have any ambition. So that allows them to be friends. If a king can have any friends. Mm. 
So then Robert talks about the time he was young. Now he looks like a bear on a horse, but being in the outdoors with his childhood buddy, ooh, that stirs a lot of emotions in the king. Mostly, it stirs up the feeling that the past was much better, because being a king is boring. They're riding their horse, and after a short while, Robert is already flushed and exhilarated. <laughs> That's all it takes. And then it says, God, he swore laughing. It feels so good to get out and ride the way a man was meant to ride. Right, that's because a king can scarcely get out there by himself. There's always an entourage. He's the king! And we imagine how a king's life is in fantasy stories, but no, no, no. For him, just a little gallop in the fresh air and he's all ecstatic. They let me out of my cage. <laughs> and as he's reminiscing about his past, it actually reveals a whole lot more about his present. He complains about the slow-moving royal convoys. Oh, those drive him crazy. The creaks and groans of that wheelhouse is actually a metaphor for the slow grind of government and ruling. Ugh, why can't we just go? It's so slow. Robert is ready to burn the wheelhouse on fire. Meaning maybe burn his reign on fire? And Ned responds, I would gladly light the torch for you. <laughs> Two goddamn fools. Robert wants Ned and him to leave everything behind. Just ride. What a childish dream. In such contrast with the grown-up job that he holds. With all these creaks and groans. The king is nostalgic. He wants them to be vagabond knights. So romantic, traveling around, killing men, and having sex with women. Robert is fixated with his adolescent years, his glory days. Like a retired professional sports player, spending most of his life living in the past, when he was potent and glorious. But no, they're grown up now. The king is not a free man. There's so much he just has to do. So what's the point of being king? Ah, there are duties to the realm, to the children, to the wives. Robert, I think he has some internal death wish. And he hates his wife. He hates her for being there and for being herself, not so much for doing something specific. Anyway, Ned and Robert, they're reminiscing. And reminiscing is always a great opportunity to embellish some, some things about your past. Ooh. So when Robert is dreaming of the past, Ned is bringing him back into the present and tells him, we are not the boys we were. And Robert, in a moment of great wisdom, replies, you were never the boy you were. Boom! Called it, confirmed, this is a great line. So according to Robert, the only time that Ned was actually the boy he was, was when he slept with another woman who wasn't his wife. <laughs> this is Robert's fondest memory of Ned's, and coincidentally, it's Ned's most shameful memory. He doesn't want to talk about it, he doesn't want to talk about it. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about Ned's story, about his bastard. So Ned's feel shame for fathering a bastard and raising him in Winterfell. No one is up to Ned's own standards. Not even Ned himself. So here they're talking about Willa, just a common woman that Ned had sex with during the war, even though he was married. Ah, this is a 14-year red herring. Robert is obviously more forgiving. He tells him, Ned, you barely knew Caitlyn, and it was war, come on. If we remember in, a, in Caitlyn's previous chapter, she doesn't even really care about, about him having sex with another woman. It's not that. She's not offended as a wife. She's offended as a political partner. I, I have a suspicion that he's converted to Judaism purely for the jokes. <laughs> and this offends you as a Jewish person? No, it offends me as a comedian. <laughs> Cheating? For them it's not even a thing. It's certainly not dishonorable. So they both have very different stories about what happens during war and what happened during that war. Robert remembers 
the killing of Rhaegar Targaryen and then the post-war doldrums and depression. And Ned, he remembers his sister making him promise. Ah, Ned, I understand. You actually did dishonor yourself, but not by sleeping with another woman. No, but by lying to your wife and to your king that you slept with another woman and that she gave you Jon Snow. It is the lying that is eating him inside. And Ned, he doesn't like to lie. <laughs> so he prefers just not talk about it. Thank you, please. Mm? And the people think that he's mad at himself for cheating. But could he be just mad at himself for lying? Or maybe he's angry at Lyanna for forcing him to make her a promise on her deathbed. Okay, so, so before we go back to Lyanna, let's talk a little bit about Ned's story about Jorah. Do you remember Sir Jorah Mormont? Robert asks him. And he's like, would that I might forget him. So the only story that we get about Jorah being in Essos is through Ned's POV. And in Ned's inner monologue, the only information that we get is that the Mormons were an old and proud house. And Jorah Mormont sold slaves for money. And that his crime dishonored the North. Not just himself, not the house. The North! <laughs> the entire North. Okay, that's a bit extreme. You know, Ned, we're all anti-slavery, but he's just one guy who broke the law. So chill, man, chill. But it's interesting in, the, in rereading because we know that Jorah's story has so much more than this. Point of view chapters. It's a perfect format for adding layers upon layers in an organic way as the story unfolds. So Jorah is feeding Varys information about Daenerys, knowing full well that Robert wants her assassinated. Treacherous Jorah will talk more about his machinations when we get to the next Daenerys chapter. Robert wants to assassinate Daenerys Targaryen. Ned has a really unconvincing argument for Robert. Killing children is unspeakable. He says that the killing of Rhaegar's sons was murder, but it was war according to Robert. So if he was okay with killing Rhaegar's sons, why do you think he'll have a problem with killing his uh, sister? They were babies. She's 13. Mm. And, they <laughs> and Ned knows this. He's thinking Robert's hatred towards the Targaryen was a madness in him. A madness. He's a little bit of a mad king when it comes to the Targaryens. His voice had grown so loud that his horse wind nervously beneath him. The king jerked the reins hard, quieting the animal. What animal are we talking about? Is it the animal in you? I will kill every Targaryen I can get my hands on until they are all as dead as their dragons. And then I will peace on their graves. Okay, okay. So let me get it straight. You dislike the Targaryens. Hmm? Am I right? So, dead Targaryen babies, Ned and Robert, they have a vastly different story about that too. Their confrontation in this chapter actually mirrors the falling out that they had when Robert won the throne with Ned's help, right? Ned was against the killing of the Targaryen babies before he even knew that he had a Targaryen baby in his family. It was a matter of principle, matter of honor. But as they're talking now of assassinating a 13-year-old Targaryen, Ned is probably thinking of the 14-year-old Targaryen he sent to the wall. He knows his best friend would be enough of a mad king to murder his best friend's nephew. Would he find out the truth? Ay, 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 ay. So tragic, so tragic. So Ned, <clears throat> he's against killing children for political reasons purposes and he's against babies paying with their lives for the sins of their parents even if sparing the kids would lead to perils in the future killing children is off limits for ned didn't we say he was an honorable guy i wish all of us could say 
that we are as staunchly against killing babies as Ned is. Robert, although very angry, he makes some good political points about the danger of Daenerys' marriage to this Dothraki warlord and his 100,000 riders. And Robert seems to understand that his own rule is unstable, that there are people plotting and scheming because they have not forgiven him. <coughs> Martels. And Robert knows, I and my children, we could suffer the same fate as the Targaryens. That kind of reminded me reports about how certain dictators <coughs> Putin, <coughs> Assad, who watched another dictator, Gaddafi, lose everything and die violently and they know that this could happen to them if they are not careful. But what Robert should actually worry about is less the traitors and more his allies, the Lannisters. Wake up, king! There is collusion! <laughs> ah, so Ned's and Robert's conversation further escalates. They differed on women, they differed on murdering babies, and now they differ on Jamie. So Ned learned from his mistake in his previous chapter of pushing to appoint young sickly boy Arryn as Warden of the East. So he proposes Robert's brother, Stannis, as Warden. But Robert has already promised to appoint someone else as Warden of the East. I didn't remember that part. He promised to appoint Jamie Lannister. What the fuck? <laughs> Is that even legal? Isn't he sworn a sworn brother of the King's Watch? So Robert, he's a king who doesn't take politics seriously. He doesn't think ahead. And he's facing a politician, Tywin Lannister, who thinks... Ten moves ahead. And Ned correctly points out, appointing Jamie, right, would, and I quote, would put half the armies of the realm in the hands of the Lannisters. Robert gets angry that Ned is telling him what to do. I've had enough of that. Nothing in his life went as he wanted. And even though this is the case by the end of the chapter, Ned says to himself that Robert always does what he pleases. Oh man, were you listening to the dude's story? Robert says he's heartily sick of secrets and squabbles and matters of state, Ned. It's all as tedious as counting coppers. Come on, let's ride. You used to know how. I want to feel the wind in my hair again. Ah, Robert. He's not a ruler, he's a war general. He only goes to fight when... The enemy appears on the field. While Tywin knows that some battles are won by the pen, not the sword. Huh? Robert is no match for Tywin. He's probably too busy tweeting about the Targaryens. Huh? But you know what? <laughs> I'm not even sure about Robert's abilities as a general. Fighting only when the enemy appears on the field. That's how you fight. Huh? How about planning in advance? Before the enemy appears on the field. So, we might, so you might maximize your chances of success. He might just be a great soldier and nothing else. He's like, everything is fine right now. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's boring. <laughs> You're the king. What do you mean it's boring? Uh, so they each have something they're sensitive about and they don't want to talk. Ned, it's his bastard. And Robert is ruling. So Robert stupidly says that Jamie's life and fortune and honor are all bound to mine. Hmm? Really? Because I actually remember <laughs> reading about him talking about killing you. He's sleeping with your wife. <laughs> and you're defending him and appointing him as, we're, as, as warden of the East. Ah, he cock blocks you and you reward him for it? You cock! <laughs> So first, someone slept with your fiancé, and now someone is sleeping with your wife. <laughs> Robert is supposed to be this alpha. No, 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 you're a supreme cuck. So Ned, he has a speech ready about what actually happened in King's Landing. Ooh, he has an ace up his sleeve. Now that I'm going to tell Robert about the whole truth about Jamie, oh, Robert is going to be furious. Ooh. Are you ready for that, Robert? Are you ready? Okay, so try to picture this scene. I want to read it as it is because it's so good. This is my favorite part of the chapter. 
I cannot answer for the gods, your grace. Only for what I found when I rode into the throne room that day, Ned said. Ares was dead on the floor, drowned in his own blood. His dragon skulls stared down from the walls. Lannister's men were everywhere. Jaime wore the white cloak of the king guards over his golden armor. I can see him still. Even his sword was gilded. He was seated on the iron throne, high above his knights, wearing a helm fashioned in the shape of a lion's head. How he glittered! This is well known, the king complained. But Ned, he's not done. Ugh. I was still mounted. I rode the length of the hall in silence between the long rows of dragon skulls. It felt as though they were watching me somehow. I stopped in front of the throne, looking up at him. His golden sword was across his legs, its edge red with the king's blood. My men were filling the room behind me. Lannister's men drew back. I never said a word. I looked at him seated there on the throne, and I waited. At last, Jamie laughed and got up. So Ned sees the Lannisters' treachery of the Targaryens, both by Tywin and by Jamie, to somehow have him involved with this dishonor. It makes him angry to remember that Jamie later cracked a joke. Starks don't joke. Star <laughs> Starks don't glitter. They don't like glittering. <laughs> so Ned's arguments at this point about Jamie are ridiculous. He's, he's telling Robert, Jamie killed the Mad King. Ooh, Jamie sat on the throne. Ooh. Did you know he was smiling? No. He was smiling? Then I will just have to break up my ruling coalition and go to another civil war. Thank you, Ned, for your sound advice. Uh, didn't you just hear Robert saying that he wishes every Targaryen was dead? He's happy Jaime killed the Mad King. By the way, important note, Jaime did not stab the Mad King in the back like they say in the show. No, he slit his throat. He walked up to him, looked him in the eyes, and killed him to his face. It adds to Jamie's complexity versus the cowardly stabbing the king in the back in the TV show. Okay, so basically Ned thinks that Robert's reign is tainted because of Jamie Lannister's king slaying and Tywin Lannister's treachery at the gates of King's Landing and because of all the baby killing in the Red Keep. There was no honor in that conquest, Ned says. To which the king replies, the others take your honor. But as foreshadowings go, must be a bad sign for the king to get his throne through treachery. So Robert is defending Jamie. There is no other place to sit in the throne room besides on the Iron Throne, which is a monstrous, uncomfortable chair in more ways than one. But Ned, he's like a robot. He doesn't care that Jamie was 17 at the time. 17? He's mad that he sat there for a moment. He says that Jamie had no right. Oh, shut up. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go back to the story that Robert tells himself about Lyanna. Let's go back to the line when he says to Ned, You were never the boy you were. Ah, poor Robert, you should be saying that to yourself. Because you too were never the boy you were. The way you tell, the, way you tell the story about your life has very little to do with how things actually went down, to put it mildly. You know, Robert prefers to live in an imagined glorious past about a true love that was tragically taken away, then raped. And without her, there's just no fun anymore. Everything is dull. You know, the hero won the throne, but it was a Pyrrhic victory. Think about it. Robert's most significant moment ruined his life. He wanted to win more than he wanted the actual power that winning afforded him. Hmm? He wanted to win the girl. 
He says as much. But there he lost. And he's still bitter about it. What good is it to wear a crown? Robert says. The gods mock the prayers of kings and cowherds alike. So, where did everything go wrong? Well, 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 it's those damn Targaryens. But we can actually ask ourselves, would Robert have enjoyed being king had Lyanna been by his side? How much did he actually know her? How much in love can you be? Sounds like a teenage crush that you get over sometime during the 15 years that have gone on since then. Ugh. <laughs> Robert, you're being pathetic. <laughs> it's a choice not living in the present. <laughs> so Robert imagines Liana being raped hundreds of times. <laughs> it's as if his subconscious is telling him that he's actually a spurned lover and she's been fucking someone else now and he can't stop these images from popping through his head about his former girlfriend having sex hundreds of times why would you imagine her being raped hundreds of times by Rhaegar Robert come on wanna talk about it I can get you an appointment with Noga so Robert has to suppress that very possibility because if Lyanna actually chose Rhaegar over him if she loved someone else then Robert He's just a usurper, just a sore loser, whose wounded ego pushed him to start a bloody war. Or he's just a dude who got played for a fool, because she wasn't raped. She made love to Rhaegar. So the manliest man in the story, the super alpha male, he now lives a life that he hates. Does what he's told, has no freedom and was cock blocked by a hard playing sensitive liberal. <laughs> Hey, when you consider all that, you get the sense that hating the Targaryens is the cornerstone of Robert's identity. Without hatred for the Targaryens, the whole story he tells himself will fall apart in a second. The whole story that he tells himself about himself to make sense of what happened. Boom, crashing down. And that's something that Robert would do anything to avoid. So he tells himself a little story. I had a beloved. The bad man took her. And the bad man's bad father, he was also bad. So I had to take arms with my friends, stand up for what's right, and save the girl, and save the world and become the king. <laughs> but the Targaryens ruined everything. So he hates them and he wants to kill them all. Hey bro, wake up. She never loved you. <laughs> and Nelly knows all that. He knows it. But he has to listen to him go on and on about Liana. How, but how much he loved her. But Nettie has to carry that truth, knowing all too well that it's a lie. But Nettie has to just be there and take it. Think about it. And Nettie wants to be there for his friend. And that must be just so taxing, juggling all these emotions at the same time. With what, with his dead sister and his friend and all that. <laughs> no wonder Ned is a party pooper. He's just exhausted. Okay, okay, let's go to Ned's story about Lyanna. So, so Ned and Robert had a fight about the dead Targaryen babies. And Lyanna's death brought them back together. Also, think about that. Robert was so sad about his lost beloved. And they probably talked about it so many times. And it was fresh in Ned's head that Lyanna didn't care for Robert at all. She loved Rhaegar. It was all an act. Maybe Ned made up with Robert because he felt guilty about lying to him. Hmm? We got it. Ned, he's honorable. Or is he? Is he actually honorable? One could argue that Ned actually has a pretty surprisingly flexible view on honor. Does he think that his sister was dishonorable? Because what actually happened is that Lyanna fell in love with Rhaegar and her dad and her older brother had to get tortured and killed because of that. And an entire realm had to go to war over it. Thousands of people had to die because of her teenage love. Not only lords and knights, but mostly simple folk who were called to fight because a spoiled 16 year old had dreams of Romeo and Juliet. Two lovers from houses that hate each other. 
And you know, 16, that's the age where you're so self-absorbed that she thought her love was special. That it made her special. It made her so much more important than all of those thousands of people who got killed. Mm. And women and girls who, because we know this story, got raped. And people lost family members, homes, their livelihoods. All this blood and grief of incredible proportions because Liana fell in love with the wrong guy. Ned's father, and I mean father with a capital F, Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. He decided that his little daughter should marry this guy in order to benefit the North. And she just said, no daddy, I'm in love with someone else. Okay, okay, okay. We know Ned. Does he look kindly on Starks going back on agreements? Mm? Does he look kindly on lies and broken promises? Mm? There was a promise of marriage and the young Stark broke it. And then everything turned to shit. Kind of like what uh, Rob would do years later, breaking his promise of marriage to Lord Frey. So think about it. Honor is the most important thing for Ned. And he chose to throw that honor away because his sister asked him to. While everyone around him goes on and on about how honorable he is. And he knows it's a lie. A damn lie. Woof, 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 woof. Let's talk a little bit about examples of good, of good writing and bad writing. Let's start with some bad writing. So Ned asks Robert, do you remember the trident, your grace? And Robert responds, I want my crown there. How should I forget it? Uh, do you remember the trident? Ugh, come on, George, you can do better than that. Okay, let's go to some examples of good writing. So the Mad King had ordered his last mad act. He had opened the city to the lions at the gate. Okay, okay, okay. This has already run too long. I could talk about it for another hour. But let's wrap it up. Let's continue the conversation in the comments. And again, I would like to kindly ask you, if you like A Song of Ice and Fire and like this rereading series, tell your friends, tell somebody, let it get more traction. I feel like there are a lot of people out there who really like A Song of Ice and Fire and are interested in it 365 days a year. Maybe they will like this video series too. Who knows? I thank you in advance. And thank you for listening. Thank you, patrons, for supporting the channel. And I'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody!